Well, welcome everyone to our Ask the Experts webinar. This is a new webinar series hosted by msexchange.org and TechGenix. Today's event features a panel of four experts who will answer questions collected by a recent survey of the msexchange.org community. Today's topics will focus on the Office 365 and Azure platforms. And if time allows, we'll be taking a few of your live questions. Our webinar is sponsored by Kemp Technologies, the number one price performance load balancer and applications delivery controller used by thousands of businesses who consider IT, e-commerce, web and business applications as mission critical to their long-term success. Kemp helps companies rapidly grow their businesses by providing 24 by 7 infrastructure availability, better web performance, and secure operations, all while streamlining IT costs. My name is Roger and I'll be the event moderator. We are recording today's event and all participant lines are muted. So if you need any assistance during the event, please use the questions or chat feature on your control panel to send a question or a chat through to me and I'll try to help. As you can see, we've uh, gathered a, an excellent panel of four experts to share their time and knowledge with you today. Steve Goodman has worked in the IT industry for over 16 years and works as a consultant for one of the UK's leading Microsoft partners, Cyber UK, with a focus on Exchange, Office 365, and Link. Steve is involved with the Exchange community via his blog. He is also an author and hosts an Exchange Link and Office 365 podcast called UC Architects. Michael von Hornenbeck is a Microsoft Certified Solutions Master and Exchange Server MVP from Belgium. And he works for eNow, a market leader in monitoring and reporting software for Microsoft Technologies. Michael specializes in Exchange, Office 365, Active Directory, and a bit of Link. He is an active contributor to the Exchange community by writing articles for several tech websites, his own blog, and by participating in the UC Architects podcast. An Exchange guy to his core, Bhargav Shukla, grew up with Microsoft Technologies and became an expert in several of them with Exchange and Link topping the list. Bhargav currently works at Kemp Technologies as a Director of Product Research and Innovation and provides insight to make Kemp ADCs even more awesome. He was recently awarded Microsoft MVP for Microsoft Exchange and holds Exchange Link MCM and Exchange Link MCSM certifications. Keith Mayer is a Senior Technical Evangelist at Microsoft for Cloud and Enterprise Platforms. Keith has over 10 years of experience as a technical leader of complex IT projects. He's consulted and trained thousands of IT pros worldwide on the design of enterprise technology solutions. Keith is certified on several Microsoft technologies, including Private Cloud, System Center, Hyper-V, Window, Windows Server, SharePoint, and Exchange. And he can be found online at keithmayer.com. Well, panelists, let's dive right in. Uh, as a reminder, for the benefit of our audience, please uh, state your name prior to any of your responses. And our first question, uh, this one is for Keith, is uh, on our, our topic of Azure. What is the biggest benefit to running Azure with MS Office 365? Keith? Well, that's a great question. So, hi, everyone. This is Keith Mayer from Microsoft. And that's a really common question that we get from lots of organizations that are currently running common business application services on Office 365. Applications like Exchange Email, SharePoint, Collaboration, OneDrive for Business for Document Storage, Link for Instant Messaging. And really what you want to think about Azure as, as an extension of that Office 365 platform. Azure is our cloud platform for providing the ability to run customized business applications, line of business applications, applications that you run your company on that are running on Windows Server or Linux from a virtual machine standpoint. But it also allows us to extend Office 365 and other innovative ways as well by developing custom web applications or websites that can easily integrate into a SharePoint platform for surfacing those custom applications through SharePoint Online in Office 365. For extending Office 365 with mobile, custom mobile application support. And also from the standpoint of extending Active Directory. Now I know a lot of you probably are running Office 365 and have 
already married up your Windows Server Active Directory with Office 365. What Azure allows you to do is to take that hybrid Active Directory infrastructure and also extend it across providing single sign-on to literally thousands of other third-party commercial SaaS applications that are across the board, outside the Microsoft ecosystem. So it allows you to really take your investment in Office 365 today and by leveraging Azure, align it to supporting those custom business apps and, and align it to supporting single sign-on and management and security for, for other SaaS applications as well. Well, great. Um, next question, and this one is for Steve. Does Azure and Office 365 make financial sense to run the whole infrastructure for 2,500 user, a 2,500 user enterprise and approximately 200 servers? And how will cost and reliability compare to VMware? Steve? Hello, Steve Goodman here. Uh, so comparing VMware to Azure and Office 365 isn't really comparing apples with apples. They're not the same thing. Uh, so VMware in general for most organizations is combined with storage area network or shared nothing storage and it acts as the platform that people use to run their servers on. Office 365 is, it is in essence software as a service. First of all you can't buy uh, the Office Suite for the Office Pro Plus desktop product as part of VMware. So you're getting, for a start, a whole different type of infrastructure. You're getting a multi-tenant messaging environment, a SharePoint environment, Link Online, and all those other different parts that make up the different component Office 365 plans. And the same applies to Azure as well. So if we're thinking of it as infrastructure as a service, then we can directly compare it to what we get with VMware. For example, we can move VMs uh, into, into Azure and run those VMs as is. However, if we want it to be more reliable than it could be on-premises with VMware, we might want to re-architect those applications so we can save money and build more reliable systems. So it could cost more and be less reliable if you just moved everything across. But if you looked at the way that you're doing it now, and thought, is there a better way? Then you might find it can be cheaper and much, much more reliable, as in multi-continent reliable versus multi-data center reliable with VMware if you embrace all the different components of Azure and Office 365. So they, the two services complement each other. They're not directly comparable to VMware. And yes, it can be cheaper and more reliable than a VMware infrastructure for approximately 200 servers, but you might have to rethink the way that you deploy it. That's a great, those are a really great points, Steve. This is uh, Keith from Microsoft, and one of the other aspects that I hear a lot of customers thinking about in terms of reliability with cloud services like Office 365 and Azure is that cloud platform services like Azure and Office 365 provide a service level agreement as part of a core commitment to delivering those services back to customer organizations. And that's something that for on-premises deployments today, you really don't have because you as a customer organization are really responsible for managing in an on-premises environment all of the hardware and software. And so the service level agreements that are in place that are financially backed and provided as part of both Azure and Office 365 are, are really intended to assist in providing very stable platforms that if we're not meeting service level objectives are financially backed and, and it's really in our best interest to provide ultra reliability to the customer organizations as well. Something that something that you can bank on and then as you look at reliability of your applications leverage in terms of overall availability of, of your applications as well. Very good. Well, uh, thank you, Keith and, and Steve. Next question, uh, uh, this one's for Bargov, and this is uh, similar to the last one, so maybe you can, it's a two-part question. So the first is, what's the difference between Azure and Office 365? Uh, so uh, let us know if you have anything to add to that. And then the second part is, uh, how do you can you compare how you would collect documents for legal holds from both Azure and Office 365? 
Hey, this is Bargo. So I'll tackle the first question first. Uh, what is the difference between Azure and Office 365? So Office 365 is uh, obviously an office suite. It's offered as software as a service. Uh, what you basically get with Office 365 subscription is uh, Exchange, Link, SharePoint. Uh, the Office suite products are run um, in cloud. It, the software is managed. The, uh, the servers the software is running is managed uh, by Microsoft. So as an administrator, you have to manage your users and you have to manage licensing and subscription aspects of the software. Uh, it relatively takes off the administration of the servers, management, patching, updates, upgrades, break fixes away from you. You don't have to worry about any of that. When you look at Azure, Azure actually provides you multiple different options. One of them is to run platform as a service. If you're a developer, you can write your own applications and you can publish it uh, through Azure in one of many ways. Uh, the other option you have with Azure is infrastructure as a service where you have full control over which VMs you're going to deploy, whether it's Windows or Linux when to deploy it, where to deploy it, how to deploy it. And uh, you basically are in charge of managing um, the VM configuration, the operating system installation, although Azure helps you with the process of installation of the, of the operating system. Uh, but as an admin, you have full access to it and you have uh, full control of the behavior of the VM and the software running inside the VM. So it gives you multiple options and quite a bit of a, a flexibility on how you want to run your software in cloud. Uh, the next question was how do you collect documents for legal hold from both Azure and Office 365? So let's look at Office 365 first. Uh, in Office 365, you have the documents stored in one of uh, two or three possible ways. Uh, one is uh, through Exchange. You have attachments. Uh, you have emails, just plain text. Um, then you have documents stored in SharePoint um, and, and the information that is stored in SharePoint. Uh, with Office 365, you have those products integrated and as long as the right uh, permissions are assigned, a person who has access uh, to legal hold features can use the Discovery Center from SharePoint or the commandlets from uh, Exchange side to run the query and find the documents, find the information, find the emails that are relevant to you uh, for the given case, for the given query, for the given problem. And once you find those information, you can put the emails, you can put the mailbox entirely or the SharePoint site and the information that is relevant on the legal hold for preservation of data. Very good. Thank you, Bargo. Next question, and I'll give this one to Michael. How are partners, resellers, integrators making business with Office 365 and Azure? Hi there. This is uh, Michael. So um, that's an interesting question because um, when talking to you know, several partners, I get that question quite often. So how can you make a business around Office 365 and Azure? And, and typically, I, I'd say there are you know, many ways to go about um, Mostly it's about adding uh, value to the offering. Obviously, Office 365 and Azure are great platforms. They are very flexible, as Keith and Steve already pointed out. There's a lot of things that you can do with it, and especially you know, using the one to help the other one is, is something that uh, I can see a lot of value in. Um, so for instance, uh, I believe that a lot of partners are um, leveraging their knowledge about those platforms to go back to the customer. and talk to them about how to be productive using Office 365, how to best use Office 365, or how you can leverage, for instance, Azure VMs to deploy part of your infrastructure there to support, uh, for instance, single sign-on for Office 365. Um, mostly helping customers to get there is uh, another way of doing business. So um, I'd say that migration services, uh, assistance in migration, um, expert level um, information on how to use those services are great ways to, to set up a business around that. Um, and you could go on 
for hours and hours because it's there are so many things that you can do with either of both. I mean, I just mentioned Azure VMs as supporting um, or as a possible way of supporting the ADFS infrastructure of Office 365, but obviously there is much more uh, within Azure. Uh, within Azure, we have the entire Azure AD component, which obviously is also used by Office 365, but then you have the Azure uh, AD premium features, you've got the multi-factor authentication features, and then being able to um, create, to uh, deploy solutions around these um, features that are available and create an added value for your customers is, is the way how you can you know, easily create value and business around these offerings from Microsoft. Great. Thank you, Micah. Uh, next one, we'll go back to Keith. Uh, the question is, a reminder, these, these are questions uh, right now that we're covering that we're, uh, we received from the MS Exchange that our community uh, specific to the uh, Azure platform. Uh, so the next question is, do I set up a group of VMs or set up a cloud service in Azure? What, what criteria determines which? Keith? Hi, everybody. This is Keith Mayer from Microsoft. And, and that's a great question as well and really touches on a point that Steve had mentioned a little earlier around thinking about cloud architecture a little differently than you may think about architecture in the on-premises world. When you create Azure VMs, um, Azure VMs run inside of a cloud service or, or a set of cloud services. Even if you just jump right in and create your very first VM, Azure behind the scenes will automatically create a cloud service that provides an environment that that VM runs inside. And what that cloud service environment can provide are security firewall services for the VM, load balancing, and availability for that VM running on the Azure platform. Generally, the way that applications are architected in running Azure VMs is if you think about a common, maybe a two-tier web application where you've got a set of VMs that are running your web server and a set of VMs that are providing the data, the databases that those web servers are presenting. Each of those tiers of VMs would commonly run inside of a separate cloud service. So you might have a web tier cloud service that provides load balancing and availability across all the VMs that are running that tier of your application. And have a data tier cloud service that provides load balancing, availability, and security around your database VMs. And then inside each of those cloud services, you would create your multiple VMs tie them to a common availability set. And in Azure, what that availability set tells the Azure Fabric is to make sure that the VMs are automatically located inside separate fault and upgrade domains. So that as if any hardware faults were to occur or any platform upgrades need to be performed, the VMs being part of a common availability set are located in separate domains so that a failure or an update doesn't take down all of those load balanced VMs that so provides high availability from that standpoint. And then firewall and load balancing and public IP addressing can also be associated with, with those cloud services as well. So think about the cloud services as really a container of a group of VMs. And as you get started, you can certainly just run out and create a, your first VM on the Azure platform and, and allow, use the, the auto-generated cloud service. But but most IT professionals are taking a step back and kind of thinking through the architecture for more complex applications, multi-VM applications, to define their cloud services first, and then inside each cloud service to build out the appropriate VMs that are then load balanced across for providing that portion of the application. Great. Thank you, Keith. Uh, continuing on the topic of the Azure platform, uh, our next questioner ask what exactly are the benefits of Azure over an on-premise solution? It is Vargo. Um, when it comes to on-prem, uh, let's, let's just walk through the on-prem scenarios first. So when you uh, have any of the applications deployed on-premises, uh, you're looking at uh, many different components. Uh, when you're looking strictly at the infrastructure, you're looking at server, network, power, space in your data center. But 
then you have to add to it the administration cost, the cost involved with leasing or replacing the servers over time, um, air conditioning equipment and the maintenance of all the relevant components, uh, expertise of course to run those systems and as uh, people manage all those different systems you have to account for the certification or training, ongoing uh, updates to your knowledge. You have to account for all those different components. Now compare that same uh, to Azure, all those different components still apply. The difference here is uh, you basically pay as a customer a, a monthly cost of using the components for your application. So if you need uh, different VMs or if you're publishing your code that will run on X amount of resources whether it's CPU, memory, networking components and everything else. Um, you can pay for that monthly. You get the access and the benefit here is you get the quick spin up of your VMs compared to on-premise depending on how it's laid out. Uh, Azure gives you ability to spin up, for an example, an entire SharePoint farm very quickly because it's the solution that's provided uh, to the customers instead of spinning up singular VMs and creating the components, creating the Active Directory component and installing SharePoint on your own, creating the farm and load balancing. Uh, so that's that's huge benefit right there. Uh, again, when you compare to all the other costs that I mentioned earlier that applies to on-prem, those are hidden from you. You don't have to deal with the leases. You don't have to deal with the lease replacements of your servers. You don't have to worry about where you are going to move the applications from and to. Uh, it is also possible as an IT person, you are not responsible for those applications directly. So now you have to coordinate with the business units who may or may not have the same resources, who were actually aware with the application deployment when the application was actually deployed first time. With Azure, you don't really have to tackle those scenarios with leases or server replacements and such. Um, any component failures are handled for you automatically as well. And uh, they are backed, like Keith mentioned earlier, with the financial SLAs. Thank you, Marco. Yeah, those, uh, we'll are, go those are I'm great sorry. points, Markov, and, and I, those are great points, Markov. This is Keith from, from Microsoft, and I would, I would add to that that from a business standpoint, the other aspects of what Markov had mentioned are huge in many business organizations today because what I see when I talk to customers is a growing disconnect between business requirements and traditional IT planning. What I mean by that is many business organizations are under constant pressure to innovate and deliver solutions faster than ever before, more quickly than ever before. And you, in your own organizations, have probably heard about solution delivery and development teams looking at continuous innovation, continuous improvement and delivery of solutions. And the challenge is, is that in a traditional on-premises world, the capital cost planning for providing and hosting your own infrastructure to, a, to, pro, to, to provide those IT solutions is generally a, a very lengthy process that occurs on an annual basis, an 18-month basis, in some cases in some organizations still on a two to three year process. And the timing of it doesn't allow an IT infrastructure organization to be dynamic to the level of being able to support new business applications and the elastic growth that many business applications are requiring today. And so where I see a lot of organizations turning is to say, look, we're looking at cloud platforms like Azure to be able to offload the dynamic needs that we see growing and subsiding and elastically expanding and contracting very quickly of things like on-demand workloads for dev and test of new solutions, for storage, for uh, batch jobs, for web-facing applications that may have unpredictable demand needs so that we can recapture some of that agility and at the same time continue to leverage our on-prem investment and in infrastructure for those traditional applications that are 7 by 24 well-known kind of line of business applications today that we don't see that same level of dynamic growth around. 
And, and so the, the aspects that Bargov had mentioned really allow an IT organization to transform into being much more agile in terms of planning for continuous delivery, continuous improvement of new solutions, while at the same time optimizing their on-premises environment for continuing to host their existing solutions. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Keith. And um, we're going we're gonna to now move on to uh, our Office 365 uh, topic questions. And I'm going to start with one for Michael. Question is, how about public folder migration from on-site MS Exchange migration to Office 365? Is that scenario supported? Yes, it is. So uh, this is Michael again. Um, an interesting question because um, as, as more and more people are moving to, to Office 365, uh, obviously they'll be dealing with public folders sooner or later um, because despite what many people you know have been trying for many years, there are still a lot of companies out there that use public folders either on Exchange 2007, 2010, um, and even on Exchange 2013, they're you know, fully supported. Um, when you're already on Exchange 2013, I'd say that moving mailboxes uh, or public folder mailboxes to Office 365 is relatively easy, especially if you're in a hybrid deployment. It's, it's basically moving a mailbox and then there you go. But um, moving from, from legacy versions, and, and uh, by legacy I mean Exchange 2007 or Exchange 2010, requires a little bit more planning. Uh, without going into detail or you know explaining the entire high-level process because that would lead us way too far, um, it, it's basically the same process as, as you would go through as when moving mailboxes from your own you know on-premises from your legacy versions to Exchange 2013. Um, but this time you'll be you know, directing them, you'll be moving them to Office 365. So it involves uh, six or seven different steps by exporting the public folder hierarchy, exporting them to a CSV, going through that CSV file, and um, you know, uh, re-importing those then, and then shipping them off for a, a migration, which is a sort of one-off um, action that you do. So it, it isn't, you know, uh, there isn't a way that you can move two mail two public folders and do another two public folders. Um, while taking the, the, the built-in tools, I'd say. However, uh, there are some third-party tools which may assist you moving public folders more easily into Office 365. Now, by more easily, I'm not really you know, mentioning that moving public folders is extremely difficult, but it's definitely something that requires a little bit more planning and, and you, you need to take your time to do that. Um, but once you've moved them you know, for the very first time, um, then go ahead and, and you'll see that it's, you know, it's very doable. It's daunting, especially when you take a look at the information that is available and how to move them. You might think, oh my god, how am I ever going to pull this off? But, you know, if you actually do it once, you'll see that it's, it's okay. So, yes, it's definitely possible. Great. Thank you, Michael. Continuing on the topic of Office 365, uh, we'll throw this one over to Bargov. What Office 365 version is there in the cloud? Is it Exchange 2013? It is Bargo, yes. Uh, the answer to that one is relatively quick and easy. Uh, the current version uh, in Office 365 for Exchange is Exchange 2013. Having said that, you got to remember uh, Exchange 2013 has service packs, the uh, cumulative updates. Office 365 uh, usually has uh, a faster cadence, so it usually gets the updates before uh, the CU is published uh, out in the open for the on-premises. Um, so it definitely is, to answer the question, uh, it is running Exchange 2013 and the most current uh, CU, uh, as well as there might be additional updates that might be coming in the future CUs. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll throw this next one over to Steve. When will there be two-way Active Directory sync for Office 365? Hello, Steve here. Uh, so, in theory, that's happening now. So if you're using Directory Sync or the Windows Azure Active Directory Sync tool, uh, a number of attributes, especially to do with Exchange Hybrid, are synchronized back to your on-premises organization. Um, but they are, there's, I think, about seven attributes, uh, primarily things like proxy addresses get synced back from the cloud to on-premises. Uh, but that, that, I don't think that's what the, the, 
the person asking the question really means. They mean when will they be able to uh, edit uh, attributes for anything in Office 365 and they'll, they'll push back to the on-premises AD. Well, some of that is, is coming at the moment. So with features like Azure AD Premium, we have the ability uh, to do password write back, which allows the password to be changed in Office 365, and that password change to be pushed through the Dersync server to on-premises. Organizations that are, are using perhaps a partner to help them with FIM or have got some FIM experts in-house already de developing their own custom solutions to allow synchronization of their own in-house supported solution to allow synchronization of attributes from the cloud to the on-premises AD. Um, but in the future, we'll really be looking at where uh, the Azure AD Sync tool is going to come in. And that's something that's in beta at the moment, uh, or in preview. The, the third version of that came out just a week ago. And that's where we'll see those improvements, where we'll see more right back from the cloud to on-premises. Um, but it's not here right now. So if you have a look in another six months, we're likely to, likely to see some massive developments in that area. Very good. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next question for Michael. What are the pros and cons of Office 365 and on-site compared to the on-site version of MS Exchange? So um, this is a very interesting question. Thanks. So uh, Michael again here. Um, I mean, as Keith mentioned earlier when he was talking about Azure, uh, there are some clear benefits that you get with, with Office 365. Um, to kind of summarize everything, you don't care about the servers anymore. That's basically what you know, Microsoft takes care of. They make sure that the servers are up and running, that data is available, that your mailbox is there when it needs to be there, that you're able to connect. So they did take care of being sure that the infrastructure, which you, you know, previously took care of on-premises, is up and running. So they make sure it's secure, that whenever you need access to your email, you have access to your email. That's a clear benefit because now you can focus on what really matters, uh, on your productivity, on actually using the software instead of maintaining it. So this being said, however, um, it is uh, not entirely though, but it's a sort of you know one size fits all. Um, and I know it's a dangerous ex expression because Office 365 is extremely flexible, and I mean you, there's a lot of things that you can do, but. You can't go in into Office 365 and tell Microsoft, hey, we want you to set up a VPN with a side of ours uh, because we have, you know, need better connectivity. I'm just mentioning a, um, you know, an example there. This is something that you could do on-premises. Um, so there are things that you can do in the on-premises software, which you're obviously not be able to do because it's a shared platform in Office 365. And if you ever have that need, if you have a business need, need which tells you, I need to be able to do X or Y, or I need to integrate that application that we use, our business application with Exchange, um, then obviously the on-premises solution has some more benefits over Office 365. There are some other things too, some limitations in the service, um, limitations towards the uh, message sizes. So uh, for instance, I had that customer uh, not so long ago that used their messaging system as a um, way of transporting larger files because they were drawing plans and they weren't able to use any other solution, which means that they regularly send messages with you know, attachments that are really large, larger than the item limit in um, Office 365. Well, for them, they had pretty much no other solution than keeping it on premises. So, um, I mean, we can go on for hours and, and mention the pros and the cons for the on-premises software, but in the end, it's it's basically the same software, the Exchange 2013, especially that one, is pretty much the same feature set on premises than in the cloud. However, as Microsoft mentioned for um, uh, a while ago, they will develop new features cloud first. And, and one of them uh, recently got you know, introduced is, is the people view. And another feature that's going to make it into Office 365 for is, first is clutter, which may or may not come to uh, the on-premises world. Um, so, I mean, if you want the latest and the greatest features and really have something that works beautifully, then Office 365 is definitely a, 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 a good platform. And it's not only for Exchange, it's also for Link and for, um, for SharePoint, even though there are some restrictions, like for instance, um, 
phoning in into Link, if Link Voice doesn't work in Office 365 at this time, maybe it will in the future. So sometimes you have to revert back to the on-premises software for features that aren't there. But over time, I'm pretty sure we'll have a feature parity any everywhere, and then it just comes back to where do you want to focus? Do you want to focus on managing your environment yourself, or do you want to focus on having you know, uh, the ability to be more productive with it and just don't care about the servers and the maintenance anymore? So. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we'll go back to uh, Bargov. Oh, Steve, yeah, just to... Sure, go ahead. Uh, this is Steve here, just to, to add to some of the sort of cons to that as well. Uh, that some of the downsides of moving to the cloud versus Office 365 is where perhaps you lose the ability if you've got a lot of custom in-house applications which integrate with Exchange or third-party solutions, for example, message classification solutions that you rely on, and you might, might no longer be able to use them. Uh, another example might be if you have a, a large RDS or Citrix infrastructure where you're very reliant on clients being in online mode. And although these uh, are easy enough to overcome uh, if you embrace all the technologies, if you sometimes these can be a, a downside or a potential blocker to a migration to Exchange Online. Yes, actually, um, that you know makes me think of another thing. Um, if you go to the cloud, if you go to Office 365, um, you, you need to be aware as a customer too that there is a certain cadence. I mean, there, Office 365 is a moving target, at, at least that's how I like to see it. It's moving forward, new features are added frequently, and this also requires you as a customer to kind of stay up to date with the software that you're using on premises. Uh, and even though that it's perfectly fine for you to use Outlook 2010, um, you should know that if you're using the latest version of that software, you always get the best experience. And um, as the experience turned out is that sometimes, or most of the time, you really need to be up to date with the latest patches too, because they contain bug fixes for some of the things that didn't work in, in previous releases. So for customers that are, aren't used to being, you know, updating their computers quite regularly, this might be a challenge too. And it's definitely something they need to take into account when they move to Office 365. Very good. Thank you both. Um, next question, continuing on the topic of Office 365, and we'll throw this one over to uh, Argo. Is there a threshold less than or greater than in numbers of users when you would say you must definitely go to Office 365? Hey, this is Bargo. So, um, is there a threshold? The answer to that, I would like to say, is not necessarily. Um, it really depends how you look at the Office 365. If you look at Office 365 as a way to be more agile, to be more uh, in front of all the new innovations, as well as benefiting your organization, you could use the Office 365 offering and features starting from 10 user shop, a very tiny uh, startup, uh, going all the way to the large organizations. So there is no a specific threshold where I would like to say, you know, the Office 365 is great and you must definitely go to it. However, uh, when we look at the smaller organizations, that I like to say is a sweet spot. Again, like I earlier said, I think any organization is a good candidate for Office 365, given the pros and cons that Michael and Steve already discussed. Um, you you can be any size of company and go to Office 365. The smaller organizations really benefit from it the most because uh, smaller organizations usually don't have uh, budget, expertise, um, manpower uh, to manage the solution on premises, to deploy the servers, to manage the operating system, to deal with the lease, to deal with uh, all that comes with the data center management on top of that to be an expert in exchange and to install it properly to maintain it uh, appropriately. Uh, it brings a lot of overhead and when you're a smaller organization, you usually don't have luxury of having that benefit. Very good. Thank you, Bargo. Uh, the next one we will uh, we'll throw this one over to you, uh, Michael. 
why would I want to move to Office 365 in Azure? We have a small office of about 150 Exchange, uh, Exchange 2010, Office 2010 users, and we can't see the advantage of moving. So thanks for the question, and Michael here again. Um, I think I have to echo uh, Bargov's uh, comments on, on, you know, is there a tipping point of, of moving to Office 365? Um, I can't speak to why that particular customer or, you know, who asked the question can't see the value of moving, but I can see a lot of value, especially in smaller environments, because they, they haven't typically have the same requirements. I mean, most of the customers that I go to that have 150 seats, uh, single exchange server, they have no availability, high availability. I mean, they have a single server. So moving to Office 365 immediately gives you a, a, a platform which has a much greater uptime, which you don't have to manage anymore, and frees up time, which in the end, you know, saves you money. Um, so I'd say there are many, many advantages, especially for larger, uh, smaller environments, but it, it all depends on, on what your requirements are or what software you're using and, and uh, do you have any integration. So it, it is really difficult to answer that one spot on, but I'd say that you know, typically uh, these kind of customers should have a lot of value of Office, Office 365, though. Very good. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, I, I, I completely agree. This is, this is, uh, this is Keith. I completely agree with that, and um, you know, as an example, case in point, you know, we have extremely large customer organizations that are leveraging Office 365 and the Azure Cloud, as well as lots of smaller organizations. Uh, Microsoft, in uh, specifically, we're we're using Office 365 as our key platform for hundreds of thousands of field workers all all across the globe, worldwide, and have had uh, really great experience with it for for our users. Um, so it's not really based on size, as, uh, as, as Michael had mentioned, it's really, and Bargov had mentioned, it's really based more on feature set and availability and, and, and what you're looking to capitalize on in terms of being more agile, more elastic, lower cost, higher availability, um, a lot more of those, those business-related aspects than just pure size. Uh, Steve here. Uh, just to, to add to that, uh, th we're talking about Exchange 2010 and Office 2010. Well, there's some clear advantages because just with Office 365 alone, you also get Link Online, SharePoint Online, OneDrive for Business, and the latest version of Office. And I, I was talking to somebody else about this today. You think, how many organizations are there? So for the last few years, lots and lots of organizations have moved from 2003 to 2010. Uh, and up until about uh, a year ago, that was very, quite a common occurrence. Uh, and over the next few years, they will think about what's what's next as Exchange 2010 ages. And for a small office of 150 people on Exchange 2010, there's a very large chance that they're running on a single Exchange server, perhaps on a, a virtual machine. So at the moment, they may well be running at massive risk. If that single Exchange VM breaks, then they've got to restore from backup, and email could be down for a day. So there's a massive advantage just to consuming Exchange Online and then if you add on all the other software you get with uh, Office 365 and, of course, all the stuff you can get with Azure, then the, the advantages just pile up. Well, great. Thanks, Thanks everyone, for, uh, <clears throat> for your insights on that, on that question. Uh, we're, we're continuing to get lots of questions, and uh, obviously we won't be able to get to everyone's today, but we're going to continue to push through on our topic of Office 365. And our next question is, um, and uh, we'll throw this one over to Steve. When we go to Office 365, what are the top gotchas that we should look out for? Uh, Steve here again then. Uh, so simply put, this is one of those things where you could talk for an hour just about gotchas moving to it, things to watch for and make your migration a success. So let's see, simply put, well, first of all, things like the client to Office 365 network bandwidth, what's in between like proxy servers, those, those are key. For example, uh, organizations that have many, many sites uh, and use a single uh, output, uh, outpoint or internet breakouts in a central data center at the moment uh, may need to rethink the way that their network's organized to make best use of 365 because it's an internet-based service. And having everything go through one point could be potentially a bottleneck. Uh, with 
with uh, the simple stuff like moving uh, moving the mouse Office 365, uh, having an, a good understanding of your environment, looking for oversized messages, mailbox sizes, uh, and a, a key one, understanding across the organization uh, how sharing works, who shares with who. For example, a, a key gotcha is making sure that uh, if a team of people use a shared mailbox, the mailbox that's shared needs to go with them. Ease of calendar sharing cross-premises, it's absolutely fine to reshare a calendar, but if you've got a PA that manages a number of people's secretaries and has read-write access to those calendars, making sure that uh, you move them all together. So people who share and collaborate together as teams, you want to move over together. Uh, an easy way of, of, of making sure people can move at the same time is to use speeches to pre-stage moves. So uh, doing a sync and then doing a final switch after you've made sure that all those people are ready to switch over quickly. Uh, client upgrades, making sure that uh, the whole environment, all the clients that connect to Exchange are ready and known. You know how many active seat users there are, you know what the, what the makeup is, what steps they'll have to go and go through. If you've still got Outlook uh, 2003 in your environment, making sure that's gone, making sure that you upgrade to the latest version that you possibly can, and as a bare minimum, getting those clients like Outlook 2007, Office 2007, up to the latest version of the patches to make sure that you not only meet, but exceed the minimum requirements. Uh, the one key area that is often overlooked is making sure that you communicate with users. This isn't the kind of move where you don't have to, where you don't want to tell people you're doing it. Because not only are you moving things like the back end stuff like email, which isn't particularly disruptive, you're giving them a whole bunch of new services and potentially new software on the desktop. You're giving them the ability to use Office for iPad, uh, Link Online, a uh, new place to store and share documents, and perhaps using some of the new features that you never had before, like uh, site mailboxes uh, or RMS. So making sure that you invest in user training and real good communications and using the resources like uh, the Enterprise Change Management Kit that's available from Microsoft to help with that planning. And the adoption, uh, often people stop at the Exchange migration and go, right, we're done, we're in Office 365. But from a user perspective, they go, well, where's all the good stuff? And it's thinking about how you can drive that user adoption because you need to use all those other services because if you're paying for effectively Microsoft to give you everything, all the good stuff, uh, and it's all tightly integrated together, you might as well make sure that people use it. It's a productivity suite. As I think Michael Mayer said, uh, it's not about the technology, it's about what you can do with it now. So making sure that you think about user adoption now is really key. Well, excellent, thank you. Uh, I think we've got time for for just one or two more questions. Um, this next one we're going to uh, throw back over to you, Bargov. There has to be one driving force for moving to Office 365. Other than we've always used we've always used Office e rather than using the we've always used Office argument. What do you think that driving force is or should be? Hey, this is Bargo again. Um, it's a great question, and I'm going to take a little bit of a different road here uh, in answering that question. Not necessarily always have to be the technical question, because when you look at Office 365, it's a platform. Uh, it's a platform that is offered by Microsoft as a as a as a cloud service, um, a, a software as a service platform. When you're choosing any of them, you have a lot of different. Uh, decision points that you have to go through. So let's think of what do you use Office for, right? Document creation, presentations, um, if you consider Link it's the instant messaging, if you consider SharePoint it's the collaboration. There are others who offer similar offerings, you know, Google and such. The idea here is to look at the holistic picture of not only we have always used Office and that's what we are comfortable with, but who is offering that? What's their domain expertise into a given area? What's the completeness of vision of the company that's offering it? And when it comes to Microsoft, all those pieces come together very nicely. Uh, office that you're used to, well, yeah, that's obvious. When it comes to management, it's backed by financial penalties if it's down for X amount of time, if it's not meeting the SLA guarantees. Uh, when, it's come, when it comes to the roadmap, the roadmap is clearly laid out. There is a dedicated site that shows you what's planned, what's coming, and 
you as a customer also have ability to opt in for the early uh, testing. So as, as those features are rolled out, you can opt to be the first ones to uh, start using those features or you can opt out of that so you get it in the normal cadence when the Office suite is updated for all the Office 365 tenants. Um, there are many other arguments, like I said, but you want to what you want to look at is the holistic picture of the completeness of vision, the track record of the company, uh, what you're getting with it, the benefits in terms of software licensing, and of course the usability. When you throw a whole set of tools to the users who have no idea how to use that, no matter how much money you're saving with a given solution. If you use, if your productivity is is going to take a dive, uh, it's not worth saving those money, or is it? And uh, I would certainly like to invite Keith if you have any insights here. That would definitely uh, be welcome. Great point, Bargoff. Hey, everybody. This is uh, Keith from Microsoft. With um, in addition to the points that Bargoff had mentioned, with many of the enterprise customers and even small and mid-market customers that I work at work with. They're, of course, in, in probably much the same situation that many of you are in, where they're looking to determine the ways that the IT team, the IT operations team, can deliver the most impactful results back to the business. And as part of that, what they're doing is they're going through looking at the business applications and network services that are being delivered as an IT organization. And categorizing them as those services that are more general purpose or commodity type services where there's not heavy customization as a business that you're doing around those packaged services versus the, the customized application services that you as a business de de depend on for running your line of business activities, for driving sales revenue or other business revenue and moving the business forward. And what many IT organizations are coming to their realization of is that for those more commodity services, instead of spending significant effort on hardware infrastructure and hardware support costs, moving commodity services like email and document storage, instant messaging and collaboration out to Office 365 makes a ton of sense because it enables you as an IT organization to still have control over administering the security and governance of that solution, but takes off the table huge infrastructural costs from a hardware standpoint that would otherwise be necessary to provide that same level of scale and reliability in an on-premises environment. And then take those costs that you're saving and be able to refocus those resources and those costs on more customized network and application solutions that can deliver more unique business value into the organization. And quite frankly, some of those applications may organizations are deciding to, to host through public cloud platforms like Azure as virtual machines or through the platform services that Bargoff had mentioned, while others are continuing to take some of those applications. and. And, and leave them remaining in their on-premises environment based on business factors that are really unique in many cases to the organization and the way that they run and depend on their application and network infrastructure. And that hybrid cloud approach of being able to pick the best of both worlds across public cloud platforms, private on-premises data centers, software as a service platforms like Office 365 is one of the unique differentiators that customers and other industry analysts are seeing. And it's it's one of the reasons the completeness of vision that Bargoff had mentioned, for instance, is, is one of the reasons that industry analysts like, like Gartner Group have identified Microsoft as the only cloud and on-premises provider that's been listed as a leader in Gartner Magic Quadrants across on-premises private cloud and virtualization across uh, public cloud for delivering infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. So regardless of how you're thinking about arch architecting your cloud, Microsoft's really the, the only consistent vendor that appears across the board in every one of those Magic Quadrant reports. Um, so hopefully that gives, gives you as well some comfort level that depending on which direction you may take your own hybrid cloud strategy, 
Um, you know, we're certainly, from a Microsoft perspective, in this to help provide the options that make sense to you and your business organization, not, not necessarily force every organization up to a public cloud platform, but rather provide the, the mix of options across on-prem, private cloud, public cloud, software as a service, PaaS, and infrastructure as a service, so that you can choose the unique mix of those elements that allow you to optimize your IT cost and grow the business impact that you're delivering back to your business. Well, well, thank you all. We're going to uh, wrap it up with that response, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Bargov to talk a little bit more about Kemp Technologies and their free trial offer. Bargov? Bargov, are you on mute, perhaps? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, so this is Bargo again from Camp Technologies. Uh, just quickly go over the overview of the company, who we are, uh, what we do. Uh, Camp uh, was established in year 2000. Uh, currently, uh, we have a little over 22,000 deployments worldwide. Uh, as a company, we uh, are application delivery company. So we focus on load balancers, application delivery controllers. Um, when it comes to the unit shipped, worldwide shipment, uh, we are uh, standing at a solid number three for the last two years as a worldwide uh, unit shipped, um, right after the major players that you know well. Um, when it comes to growth, we have grown tremendously over the last few years uh, compared to 500% growth over the past three and 470% growth over the past five years. Those are some impressive numbers to sustain uh, year after year, and we have done that for consistently for five years, uh, which helps us along with the uh, Microsoft competencies uh, in partnership. We very closely work with Microsoft. We uh, have achieved uh, messaging and communication con uh, competencies. And in fact, I believe, if I'm not wrong, uh, Joshua, you're on, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we also have Azure competency with Microsoft, uh, which basically just speaks volumes of how closely we work with uh, Microsoft in terms of our products, make sure our products are up to the mark when it comes to different products that we work with. Uh, what do we do, really do? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, it's all about application delivery. Our focus is very sharp. We don't try to run in many different directions that you might see with larger companies. They try to tackle all the check boxes and um, the, the features that they can offer, but we uh, tend to focus more on what we do and what we do best to provide the best price and performance for uh, the cost benefit that you can get out of our products. Um, we provide layer 4, layer 7 load balancing, SSL offload, comprehensive health checks at the application level, uh, intrusion protection with the security uh, snow rules. Uh, all these different features that you would expect from uh, one of the best application delivery controllers out in the market. Um, one thing that I do want to point out is application specific configuration templates for Microsoft applications and this is not limited to it either. We are always expanding our portfolio of uh, application specific templates and health checks that are available for download from our website. Uh, as we go on you would have more and more uh, applications from Microsoft that would have uh, the templates along with the deployment guides that are already available today. Uh, that makes your experience with the product very easy. You don't have to become a specialist in load balancing. Uh, funny enough, how I became over time uh, as I was dealing with Microsoft applications for Microsoft customers. Uh, you don't really have to be an expert in load balancing to understand how to deploy a load balancer for Exchange, for an example. And uh, that's what we do best. Uh, you can actually go to next slide, Roger. Thank you. Um, how do you get a load master? Um, if you want to try out your load master, uh, one thing that's on the slide obviously is you can download a free trial of our virtual appliance uh, from camptechnologies.com. But I want to mention a couple more things here. Uh, we actually offer four different flavors of our, uh, uh, our load masters. Uh, 
One is virtual appliance that runs on Hyper-V, VMware, Zen, uh, many different uh, virtualization platforms. Uh, that's one option. The other one is obvious uh, hardware platform that we have, the appliance that you can just basically take uh, and uh, put it in your rack. Um, I like to call them the gold boxes as they come in gold color. Um, the third one is bare metal where you can take your Cisco UCS or Dell and we are expanding our portfolio of the platforms we support. Uh, which also in, will include HP shortly if it's not included already. Uh, all these different uh, platforms when we support that in bare metal what that means is you can take your own server that you have for an example a Cisco UCS and use our CD uh, load master operating system uh, put it in and install it on your bare metal just like you're installing your Windows server uh, and it runs natively. Uh, the benefit there is you're able to use full uh, power, full resources of the bare metal server that you're using to create your own flavor of Loadmaster. And then the fourth one is the cloud flavor where uh, we actually have a fully functional layer 7 load balancer in Azure. Um, Azure currently has the layer 4 load balancer which provides you the functionality of high availability that you need for your virtual machines and uh, other instances. But at the same time, when you want to add more functionality such as content switching, um, inspection of traffic, layer 7 awareness for the applications, we are uh, very nicely complementing Azure's built-in load balancer with our product and adding the functionality that uh, provides you more more power, more features uh, to use with your cloud services. Uh, the Azure Loadmaster is completely free. It's not just a free trial. The product itself is completely free that you can get from uh, VM Depot. And uh, it comes with free web support as well. So you're not uh, basically hung dry with the requirement to buy a support contract. You can, of course, buy. Uh, support contract to receive 24-7 uh, phone support if you deem that necessary, but you don't have a requirement of buying support to use your free Azure Loadmaster, which is, like I mentioned earlier, it's just a free product that you, anybody can use. All right. Um, do we have more, Roger? I think this might be... Well, no, I, I want to thank you, Bargov, uh, and on behalf of MSExchange.org and Techgenics, I want to thank all of our experts uh, for participating today. And of course, we want to thank Kev Technologies for making it possible for us to bring you today's event. The recording of today's presentation will be available on the msexchange.org site very soon. And please watch your email for our next Ask the Expert webinar. This concludes today's event. Thank you for attending, and you may now disconnect.